just going to kind of roll down the questions I was given to answer, but it's, it's very raw, very real about, you know, you learn a lot in textbooks and in class. And my experience after leaving college was like, wow, this is totally different than everything I learned. And sure, I get the base, but I don't, I don't know actually how to work in the business world. So hopefully my 15 years of experience can really help benefit you when you get out there and you don't make the same mistakes. Like one of the questions was the failures. I feel like I could spend the whole hour on that. Um, I whittled this list down to like the top 10, but I mean, there was a lot along the way. So I wanna go back and expand upon my story. Um, I always tell that about how I got here, like why am I even here? And it's a, it's a wild kind of crazy story. Um, hopefully you'll, maybe you won't have the same experience, but I kind of freaked out when I got in the real world. Um, I was an accounting major. I was actually a finance major at a small business school in Rhode Island. And when I got out of school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And to be honest, I really didn't love accounting. Um, I knew that. I knew I didn't want to do taxes. I knew I didn't want to be a CPA. Um, but I took entrepreneurship in senior year and everything clicked, like starting a business, scaling a business, and I was engaged and I was loving it. I'm like, this is what I want to do. But it's really hard to leave college and just go and start a business. I mean, certainly you can do it, um, and I will give you the framework for that, but it was, it was tough. So I took a corporate job. I was in downtown Boston. I was humping it out, hating my life, like hating it. And it was, um, 2001 I graduated and if anyone was here back then maybe you were maybe you weren't it was an epic snow year and I was like following Alta like a hound because I had gone there on on uh, spring break and it snowed and I love to ski you all know that so that Thanksgiving there was no snow no snow and everyone's like kind of freaking out and then the floodgates open it dumps a hundred inches in a hundred hours it was like the, the infamous Thanksgiving storm and right then, at that moment, I'm like, I'm moving to Utah. And, and I didn't know when, I didn't know how, but I was like, I'm just gonna do it. So I kind of ground my year out there in corporate job. And they, like, I got promoted and everything was going well, but they were like, t came time for the raise, you know, your, your annual review. And they're like, you know, you're doing a great job, this and that. Unfortunately, corporate has said, everyone's gonna get a flat raise across the board. And I said, that's fantastic, I'm giving my two weeks notice. And they're like, whoa, whoa, they're freaking out. And I'm like, it has nothing to do with you. It didn't matter if you doubled my salary or not. I'm like, I decided all over eight months ago that I was doing this. So anyway, I go home, explain this to my dad who just shelled out six figures for my education um, and explain that I was moving out and I was gonna be making $800 a month. And yeah, he wasn't super stoked. <laughs> um, he was a little upset, but I, I explained it was a six month kind of temporary thing. Um, and that I was really excited because they were giving me a bed and a ski pass and they were gonna feed me. So anyway, I show up at this place and, and I'm super happy. Like I'm skiing literally every day. And a couple of months in, the, the controller, the bookkeeper at the lodge quits and they offered me the job. And I, I said, no, I'm like, I have to, you know, I kind of promised my dad I was gonna go get a real job and in my eyes this doesn't really, this isn't really a real job. Um, and they made it sweet enough where I started doing it. So I do that for four years and um, like she said, it, it wasn't quite enough. Like I'm not advancing my career enough, I'm not challenged and I kind of hit the brick wall there and I start expanding out looking for other opportunities. Um, I get another part-time gig as a, a bookkeeper for a restaurant right in Alta within a month they gave me the general manager job so now i do that for six years but i have a major problem that i'm making money for five months out of the year and that's it which is when my bookkeeping company was born so a lot of the questions like how how does this happen it's like honestly i i followed my heart like that was all i did i followed my passion for being in the outdoors and for skiing and I put myself where I wanted to be in an environment I knew I was gonna be happy at and I excelled and I paid attention to what was going on in the market. Um, I noticed that as I started looking in the summer, all these different small businesses and I'm looking at opportunities and everyone's advertising like, hey, I, I need a bookkeeper five hours a week in my office, you know, this was 15 years ago. So I, I'm starting to notice, hey, there's a lot of businesses out there that 
don't need a 40 hour a week person. They just need someone good for a few hours. So I started collecting these clients and that's really when my business was born. Um, made the final leap. I kind of bootstrapped that thing because I was doing it part time, but I was still managing the restaurant. That was 4 p.m. to midnight. So I worked seven days a week, 4, 4 p.m. to midnight and ran the bookkeeping during the day, skied when it snowed, basically. Um, did that until my blood pressure was out of control and I was just like, I seriously, it was like f complete burnout. Like you can't work that much and that's something that I will touch on a lot in this. So why did I choose it? I mean, I was, I was doing it, I was already there, but what was key is noticing the shift in the market and noticing the availability and going after it and exploiting that. We don't go after the jobs that are three or four days a week, that does not fit our model. So it was noticing the shift in the market and being real targeted on the specific customers. Um, another thing is it fed really well into my personal goals. I really did want to have a good work-life balance. Like I go running just about every day before work or I go hiking after work or I go during the middle of the day or we go, our office skis when it snows, like most people do. And you would think that hey, these people are gonna take advantage of it. These guys work harder for it. They will work, nobody works 40 hours in our office. They all work extra because of what we give them. The ability to go skiing, to go hiking, to go to their kids' um, events, and they really value that more than money. So I, it's important to me, and I wanted to put it into our business and see how it did, just thinking, all right, I'll test this out to see if people take advantage or do they value it and are willing to give back? And my experience has been that they will give back um, 100% if you give them that flexibility. I think a lot of you probably relate to that going out. It's like, do you want that rigid 40, 50, 60 hour week? Some people crave that. Some employees we found do need to be told, you have to be here these hours. And the people that don't, you know, they can deal with the flexibility, they tend to be the top performers. Um, so the other thing that was huge was that, uh, like I said, the, the notice and the, the need in the market, but also that I, I really was finding a lot of value in helping these businesses grow. Um, you're basically being, you're their right hand man. You're telling them exactly where they're at, where they're going. And that was a lot of fun for me. So that's kind of now what we advertise is that. We're gonna come into your business, we're gonna fill that role that you need, that part-time need. We're gonna only give you what you need and then we're gonna help you grow and kind of be a business partner without actually being a partner. Um, so the failures, I mean, we're gonna spend a lot of time on this. Like one of the questions was, what were my failures? And I just, I, I was overwhelmed with like how many there were. Um, and everybody will fail, every business owner will. The difference between success and failure is actually taking and learning from it. Those that can get over the fact that they've failed and figure out why and how they're gonna change, succeed. Those that beat themselves up over it and just get down over it, that they're not, they're not gonna make it um, because that's just not a way that you run an efficient business. So. My number one thing, um, we're not gonna talk a lot about accounting today. I, I think I mentioned it once. This is all about, like I said, raw small business and growing it. So one of the biggest things was a hiring and training process that I did not have. Um, when I brought on our first employee, um, I have to go back to my story a little bit. So as I grew this business, the other crazy thing I did for some insane reason, when I'm all by myself and I've got this business going, I buy my first house nine hours away from the office. So my, I have a house in Montana, it's where I spend most of my year. No idea why, like absolutely no explanation, again, except for the passion of fishing and just being outside. So I'm on this trip, I buy this house. I have like, and then I'm like, what, in the, what did I just, why did I do this? <laughs> I literally was like freaking out. I remember being in the Missouri and I got the call and I'm like, what, it, did, it all set in there. And so at that moment, I'm like, all right, so I'm going back to Alta and what am I gonna do? I've got this house now. So I, 
at that point, I'm like, I need to hire some help because I'm all by myself and I'm gonna need someone, if I'm gonna actually use this house, I'm gonna need someone to help me. So I hired VP of sales, a guy I moved out here with from, um, we went to college together. He's still with me today, he's my number two employee, been with me for six years now. Um, so anyway, I, I hire him and everything goes great. Randomly find this other guy, he's like 22 years old, in a bar in Alta, and I'm like, I, I'm like, oh, you're from Boston? Sweet, and we like hit it off. And I'm like hounding this guy. Like I'm literally chasing him down. I'm like, come work for us, come work for us. No experience in what we do at all. I hire both these guys and I'm like a rock star. Like they are killing it. They're like the best hires ever. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I'm the greatest businessman ever, right? I, I, I don't even have to do this anymore. All I have to do is hire people. The fourth one, complete fail. Fifth one, complete fail. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, I thought I was really good at this. Turns out if you, <laughs> you, have to, you have to find the right people, you have to inspire them, and you have to train them. I was just grabbing everyone and plugging them in, being like, oh, this is the first two worked out, so why wouldn't everyone else? Not everyone's the same. And we were putting these people in. We weren't getting them aligned with our vision and we weren't training them. And so after several failures, we finally realized, hey, we actually have to put a lot of time and money into attracting the right people, having a good job description, a good interview process, and then training them and committing to that and making sure that they understand what we want them to do. Um, we had 106 applications to our last job. I interviewed two people and hired one. So. That's a lot of time and effort we put into, how, first of all, how do we source these people? How do we then figure out who to hire? And then how do we train them to make sure they're gonna be successful? Um, I think a, uh, mostly what I'm gonna be able to talk about today is service-based business. That's, that's what we do. That's most of our clients. Product, still, it really doesn't matter. You have to be, it's, my number one concern is sourcing employees all the time. I'm always looking, even if I don't have a job, I would hire someone today if it was the right person. That's how important it is to me because I never know when I'm gonna lose someone. So that was number one on my list for sure in the failures. Um, next was focusing on a scalable system from the very beginning. It's so easy to start your business and just sell. Like all you're gonna do is sell, I need money, right? You just took this huge leap and there is no paycheck if you don't get out there and get customers. So all people wanna do is sell, sell, sell and throw it into a broken system. And the point is you have to build out your system first and make sure it's working and then you go sell. And believe me, selling is, selling is huge, that's everything. But if you throw sales into a broken system, it's completely pointless. We're still kind of battling this today, some of the mistakes that I've made. I'm still fixing some of the systems and getting them more scalable. Um, but focusing on that in the beginning, you're like, well, what, is that? what does that even mean? What is a scalable system? Um, you're going to have to kind of figure that out. Like think about, okay, this works for 10 customers, but does it work for 1,000, right? And thinking about where you are. So we're about to leap, we're at about 200 customers right now. So now we're in the process of like, yeah, it was really easy when it was 10. These systems work. Now we're at 200. How do we now go to 2,000? And everything changes. And so you have to be aware of just because it's scalable right now doesn't mean it's scalable in the future. And you always got to be aware of that. Um, next was being cheap. Like I did not invest in the marketing in the beginning. Um, I put up a crappy website and I also didn't invest in the legal aspect at all. And those are two huge areas that I would not skimp on at all. In addition to anything else, it's like, if you're gonna do it, just do it right. So the legal aspect, I can't stress enough um, that I just hopped on LegalZoom and did LLC and blah, 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 off to the races, right? I think that finding a lawyer right from the beginning, no matter how small you are, to have them set up the right entity and question them as to why, um, set up your customer contracts, your employee contracts, your buy-sell agreements, and you might say, it's ridiculous for me to do that when I, it's just me and I'm about to hire one person. I'm telling you, it is absolutely not. It's, it's critical to have those documents in place before you bring on your first person. 
um, no exit plan from the very beginning. And you're like, why would you plan to get out of your business when you haven't even started? It's, it's critical, once again, one of those things to understand, everyone just assumes, I'm gonna build this business up to a million dollars and sell it. To who? <coughs> like, who, who, why is somebody gonna buy your business and who's gonna buy your business, more importantly? And thinking about how do you, if, you know, exiting doesn't mean selling the business. I, I have a mini exit of my business coming up. I moved to Montana permanently a week from Friday. That's something I've been working on for nine years. That's a mini exit for me. I'm physically removing myself from the business. So there's a lot of things that had to happen that I had to line with, you know, customers, employee contracts, profit share, all that type of stuff. I had to line that up first and I say, okay, great. Part of my exit plan is I wanted to physically remove myself from the business and move to Montana. So on Friday, a week from Friday, that is a mini exit for me. The next, then there's more to the exit plans. Okay, where do we go from here? Um, don't think just selling your business. Um, you can remove yourself, you can have it run itself. That's a form of an exit. Um, IPO, obviously thinking pretty big there. Passing it on to a kid, making it a family business. Um, or going bankrupt. I mean, that's certainly not something you want to plan, but it is a way that people get out of their business is that, hey, this just isn't working. Um, another huge mistake is not delegating. And I think that if you just want to do the work, um, I don't know that I would recommend you starting a business because I think you're going to find yourself doing not what you think. I do maybe 2% of my month is spent doing bookkeeping. So just to show you, even if you start a business in whatever it is you wanna do, if you really wanna scale the thing and you wanna grow, you may not be doing what you think. You may not be selling widget A, you know? You're, you may not be doing all the work. So getting good at delegating is incredibly important um, and understanding what you should be working on there's a lot of crap that falls on my desk and in my inbox. And I have to make a decision what to do with it. And I, I go back to I, uh, Tim Ferriss, pretty famous author, if you've read The 4-Hour Workweek. Um, it's an interesting book. I, I don't know that it's the gospel, but it's interesting. But there's this flow chart in there, and it's, it's pretty cool. I started using it. I put it as my screensaver about a year ago. And when you implement this, it's a, it's a, it basically says you're presented with a task and you have to decide, it asks you a question that says, okay, are you gonna enjoy it? And then you follow, yes or no. Is it income producing, yes or no? And basically it comes down to three things. You either get rid of the task, you delegate it to someone, or you put it on your calendar and you get it done. But it's a pretty powerful thing that as you get busy, you start to realize that you can't do everything. And if you're not good at delegating, um, it's gonna be really hard to scale the business. You're gonna get distracted by all these little things that don't even matter. Um, and that goes back to why hiring is so important. You have to have a great team if you're going to delegate tasks to them. Um, this one is bolded, and the next two are no detailed documented process. That is one of the keys to scaling. Having a process in place is one thing. Having it documented and actually written down is huge for your business. Um, talk about training employees, right? It's so much easier. I, we ha had a new guy start today and he just read through the manual and it basically spells out, this is how we operate, this is how we work. So we have a process for marketing, for sales, for the operations. How do you bring on a customer? How do you offboard a customer? Same with employees, so that anybody at any point could come in and read that manual, understand how Salt Lake City Bookkeeping works. That's incredibly important for two reasons. One, it makes scaling and training super easy. Two, it makes an exit possible. If, I'm, if you have a choice between two accounting services, let's say, both doing roughly the same amount of revenue, and one of the guys has this manual that says this is everything, this is the Bible for the business, and the other guy doesn't, it's pretty simple which one you're gonna buy. So it makes the purchase of your business a lot, it makes it much more attractive to someone. If you come in, you're like, wow, you're that dialed in. And this is fairly a sick thought, but it does get the point across. I always tell people, 
build your business to the point where I walk out that door and get hit by a bus and die, my business thrives, it's not, it doesn't stop, right? And that's because we've got everything in place for people leave the business all the time and you can't, the business cannot stop and slow down. Once you hit that marketing juice, you're just going. So build your business that way, it's gonna make scaling and exiting possible. Um, another huge mistake, and I kind of touched on this, was focusing on the sales too much in the beginning. Um, and instead of the operations, I really think build your system, then feed the customers into it. So it's, it's a really tough balance because in the beginning, you're, you're kind of thinking you're wasting your time because you're like, what's the point of, of building out my system? I don't even have any customers for it. Um, and you, you're like, if I don't get customers, then this business is gonna fail. So I get that, it's a really tough balance, but it's incredibly important to put the time into the system as well. Whatever it is you provide, make sure it's at least good. It's gonna break, um, there's no doubt it's gonna break as you bring more and more people into it, but you gotta make the necessary adjustments. You've gotta have a decent operations before you start just funneling sales into it. Um, marketing mistakes. Um, I'm a huge, huge blogger. I, I ran the number because I was curious. I've driven almost $800,000 through online efforts um, over the life of maybe the last four years. So that's a huge amount of our business right now. Um, how we grow is through networking and referrals, but mostly online marketing, blogging, videos, all that type of stuff. Um, I did in the beginning, I was kind of outsourcing some of the, the content and the writing, um, and it was kind of a mistake. It, it got, it, it appeased Google enough to drive results organically and drive customers, but the, the messaging was confusing. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily my voice coming through to our customers, so there was a little bit of confusion there, I, at least in my eyes, like I wasn't happy with it, it wasn't authentic enough, so we brought all that back in house. So all of our content that drives all these customers is done by myself and my marketing director. Um, and I think that's really important and it is where, that is all of my, um, my job. Yes? Do you manage your Google Analytics on your own? Um, yes, well, we have, yes, somewhat, and then my marketing director is better at that and we have several outside vendors that we use for like SEO type purposes for analytics. Um, but we have a couple of different platforms we use to, in addition to Google Analytics, to really put them all together to understand where we're at. So, um, Correct legal docs, I already talked about. I, I do think that those employee contracts are absolutely crucial to have in place. Um, written out the right way, you know, then just having someone come in, fill out a W-499 and start working, it, just, it doesn't work, it's not safe. Um, not outsourcing my weaknesses. I think that that goes back to knowing what to work on. Um, one of the things we do, we do a lot of consulting for businesses. And so when I, you know, I get, I get a lot of people, um, you know, I'll go network. Hey, how's business? Oh, it's so, it's so, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Well, let's grab lunch. I'm just too busy. And these people are busy being busy. They don't know what the heck they're doing. They're running around with their heads cut off, working on everything rather than just the five things that matter. So sometimes when we consult with people, I usually ha give them a week and I say, this week I really want you to document everything you're doing and write it out for me. And I come in in a week and it's like, are you kidding me? You can't, how can you possibly work on all this stuff? So we just start bucketing it. That gets outsourced, this gets delegated. These are the five things you're supposed to be working on. This is what you're good at, this is what you like. So don't work on things that you stink at. It's pretty simple. Like, don't try and be a marketing guy if you're not, you know? Um, I would have never thought I would be a marketing person. That's all I do. I, I, I hated it in college. And now I found that it's like, well, this is actually really important and it's important for it to be authentic. Um, and not being serious enough, I still kind of am not. I could be, we could make way more money, but I like to ski and I like to fish. Um, and it, it wasn't about money for me. It wasn't about like, I'm gonna go in and be the biggest firm. I'm gonna grow this huge thing. It was about find, building a sustainable business that allowed me, that I was happy with, that made me enough money to still have a good life. That was all I wanted. I've accomplished it. 
Um, but I need to stay on task. I need to kind of be fending off any potential threats to that and kind of staying current with the market. Um, how were my failures overcome? So this is important, I already talked about that. And it was ba basically every failure was a teaching moment. And if you don't treat it that way, like I said, you're gonna beat yourself up. And there are some really tough days where you just lose a huge customer, you get an employee leaves, whatever it is. There are just some days that really are stink and they're, they're tough. And if you're just constantly looking at the negative, you're, it, it's hard to come back from that. So you say, well, how do you overcome failures? If you're good enough to learn from it, you, you can identify, okay, I understand where this went wrong, why this employee left or whatever, whatever it is. Great, find a good mentor. I'm telling you right now, those, those people are saviors and it could be a family member that's in business. Um, maybe you just wanna reach out to someone locally that you can take to lunch every now and again. Aim huge, go for the, go for the big name first. And you might be surprised, be like, oh, this guy's gonna be way too busy, there's no way. These guys, I would do it for most anyone if I had the room. And the reason is someone did it for me. Um, they, are, they did not get to where they are on their own. So most people who are successful, if you can come up with a reason, you approach, you catch them at the right time, then they're happy to do that for you, I guarantee you. Cause it's gonna be like, hey, it's gonna be quick phone calls or maybe a lunch once a month or whatever it is. Um, the worst they can say is no. So come up with your list, find someone in your industry, find someone you respect, make a list and ask them. Because those people are huge, you know? You don't know sometimes, like, you, that outside perspective can be huge. Um, why, why did I fail in this particular aspect? And you think this is, you think why, but it's hard because you're, you're just caught up in your business. And so having that outside perspective of someone who's been there, done that, is, is absolutely huge for you. Um, go big on the mentor, go for someone huge. And the other reason, you know, failures overcoming them, the other thing was continuing to focus on being as good as I could in business. So if I just failed and I let it get to me, I was never going to overcome it. So the, the huge thing was like, it, it doesn't matter. This is just a little failure. It's a bump in the road. Staying focused on the big picture, the exit plan, the vision, the mission, understanding, okay, yeah, okay, I lost a huge client today. In the grand scheme of things, it's not a big deal, but I don't wanna just brush it off. I wanna just take, okay, what happened? Learn from it, move on. What propelled me to success? I don't know that I'm successful quite, you know, I mean, sure. In, in someone's eyes, sure, I'm, I'm successful. Um, hiring the right people and selling them on the vision was, again, right back to the hiring. Um, building out that stuff, the vision and the mission, um, until I went through the Goldman Sachs program, maybe it was in my head, it wasn't really written down. It's something now employees read on the first day. Um, and it kind of sounds like it's like, that's a, that's a big corporate America thing. We don't really need that. But it's good to have in place. It, it, it really helps you take a step back and look at, okay, are, are we still staying on task with the big picture of where I want this to go? Do my employees, are they aware of it? Are they helping me accomplish my vision? And if they don't know it, then they're not helping you. So you've got to sell them and you've got to find the right people. We, I always hire for culture, never for skill set. Skill set's obviously huge, but it's not my number one focus. My focus find the right people that I think are going to align with my vision, communicating it to them and putting them into the system. I, you can train anybody to do what we do if they've got that background. So I always hire for culture. Um, Having great mentors, my brother and my dad, um, both super successful businessmen, um, plus all the people in my business network that I know that I've met over the years and building out that network and being able to reach to the specific person I need to talk to with the, the problem that I'm having. You know, My dad and my brother aren't gonna be able to solve every little thing I come up with, but other people in my business network that know that space 
will be able to help me. And so, like I said, those teaching moments and having the right people, building up your network is crucial. Staying focused on what's important. Um, I've already talked about, you know, don't, don't get caught being busy. Um, make the time for what matters. Staying relevant. This one is, is huge. Um, especially in our industry right now, it's, it's pretty disruptive, like just technology in general. And I always think about my job when I'm going through the self-checkout machine at the grocery store. And I'm like, is this accounting in 10 years? Is this me? You know, is our job going to become a machine? So I'm constantly worrying about what's going on in the industry. What new technologies are coming in to disrupt the industry? How do I understand them and use them and be, stay at the top of the industry rather than just being standoffish, big, no, no, they'll never replace me. Machine will never replace me, blah, blah, blah. I think it's really important to stay ahead of that stuff, embrace technology, and remain a leader, remain relevant in your industry. You gotta pivot when stuff like that comes up. It's like, yeah, I mean, Uber, who saw that coming, you know? And then every cab in the world just is freaking out and they're all, you know, crying to the union. It's like, hey, sorry, <laughs> you know, they don't really care. Um, the other thing for success, um, so I said, you know, operations and building the operations is important. Marketing sales is, is everything. Um, once that is built, uh, that feeds the entire business. There is no business without prospects and customers. Um, if you're able to nail that, then you're gonna have a good business. If you're not good at it, get someone who's really good at it. Eventually, you're gonna need customers. And so marketing and sales is what I focus on. Obviously, we've got the team and I've gotta worry about hiring and the big picture, but marketing and sales is really what drives the business. Okay, what skill sets should new entrepreneurs seek to be successful? Um, this was a hard one for me, um, but a healthy lifestyle is kind of the number one on the top of my list. Um, and that means, that doesn't necessarily mean you've gotta you know, like some outdoors or whatever it is. What I mean is eating and exercising is, is actually really, really important. What goes in your body comes out. That means in energy as well. I cannot go into my office and work for 10 hours. I can't do it. I, do, I take a ton of breaks. Probably every hour or two, I take a walk around the building. I run every morning. I take off to go skiing, whatever it is. I am engaged when I'm there and I'm focused. And a lot of people wanna come in, just grind out 12 hour days and then brag about it. I guarantee you that I'm putting out way more production than that person. Cause they're just coming in there and they, you can't work that much and stay focused. Some people can, but I really believe and I've noticed that when I eat healthy and I get out and exercise on a daily basis, I am much better at work. So I really encourage you to do that. It's something that I lost. I, I really just wanted to, to grow the business and I was, I was so focused on it. And really like your health starts to slip. And I mean, what good are you to anyone then? You know, so I, I do encourage that a lot. Leadership, it's, you know, that's, that's huge for me. I don't know how you build that skill set outside of throwing yourself in the fire and seeing if you're good at it. Um, asking your mentors for their tips, reading about it, but I, you've gotta be able to lead your team. You are, like I said, you're gonna have probably very little to do with what you actually do, as opposed to making sure the ship's going in the right direction and running the overall task, managing people. So you've gotta be able to lead. Um, being helpful all day. If you just show up and you're just helpful, and what I mean is, you're helping, you pretty much help people all day, including yourself. You gotta be able to help your customers, you gotta be able to help your employees, and you gotta be able to help yourself. Um, you help yourself by, like I said, leading a healthy lifestyle, um, educating yourself with books, blogs, classes, whatever it is. Same thing for your customers. They don't, like, uh, one of the big points I have is they don't really care about what you do, they just care about how you can help them. Um, so that is huge. You're going to show up and if you just show up and just, Hey, I'm here to help like everyone, you're going to have a good business. 
Um, delegation and management, I think is, like I said, that's a big one. Um, you're gonna have to be able to delegate tasks and then manage them. Manage the tasks, manage the people. Strategy, um, again, that was another big thing for me from the, the Goldman program. Um, you could read a ton about strategic planning. You can hire consultants to help you. Um, but understanding strategy and relevancy and understanding, okay, like has my strategic plan shifted because of some new technology? Accounting, um, this is the only time I'll talk about it, I promise, even though this is what I do. So accounting is important to everyone, and I'll prove it through a point. Is a shark tank everyone's probably pretty, pretty familiar with. I watch it, I used to like it more. Um, it's still good, it's funny. But what is the only thing in Shark Tank every single person has in common? There's only one thing, it's accounting. Because no person is investing in any company without grilling them on their numbers. Great, what's your run rate? You know, what's your profit margin? These guys get grilled and the guys that know it, they know they're dealing with someone who's dialed. No one, no bank, no investor should, will ever give you money without solid numbers. So even if you're not good at accounting, that's fine. Learn the basics, understand a profit and loss and a balance sheet and what it means. Hire someone to do that for you, but you've got to be able to understand that stuff and know your numbers. And then reading and writing. A huge amount of my day is spent reading and writing. First thing when I get up, um, podcasts while I run, Maybe I'm reading blog articles most of my morning, honestly, usually an hour or two. And then I read before I go to bed every single night. I write, I bet 20 hours a week right now. Um, that's just me. I'm, this is through my experience. I'm not saying something you guys need to be good at, but a lot of successful people will tell you reading is, is crucial. Um, reading a lot and trying to educate yourself. Not everything's the gospel. Read it, interpret for yourself, take what you want from it and you know, build your own business philosophy from it. So the go this one, I like this one. What golden nuggets of advice can they share that will save students time and money in starting their own business? I started making this list and I'm like, nothing on this list saves you both. So it's really hard. If I knew how to save you time and money, I would be so rich, right? Because everything on this list is either gonna cost money or it's gonna cost you time. Um, and in some cases, it's going to cost you both. It's really hard to save on both. But back to this, focus on your customer. Nobody cares about what you do. They only care about how you can help them. So networking is a great example. Everyone wants to just sell to you. You know, this is what I do. You know, buy from me. Terrible approach. Go to a networking event and Ask yourself, how can you help this person? Whether that be through a referral, you're not there to work with people you're meeting at a networking event. You're there to see if you can help everybody that they know. And if you go in with that approach rather than just sales, generally show up and try and help people at a networking event. So remember that when you're, making your, you're doing your marketing message, you're trying to sell, nobody cares that I do bookkeeping. They don't. They just want their pain solved. So you have, to, you have to think about how am I gonna help this person? Sure, if it's through bookkeeping, that's great, but tell them how and why I'm gonna solve their pain. I think that's a huge one. Understand why you should be working on time management. Um, yeah, I, I dismiss a lot of stuff. I just literally just gets deleted because I realize it doesn't even matter if it doesn't get done. Um, I delegate a ton and then I, and then I calendar stuff. And I think that's the way to get it done um, is to actually b put it on your calendar and get it done and stay focused. Otherwise, I mean, your to-do list never ever gets accomplished. It just sits there and you, you do something and then you get distracted by the next task that comes across your desk. So calendar stuff, understand if it's mission critical, delegate it if it's not. Start a blog. My dad told me, I was like, you're nuts. I'm like, this is a terrible idea. I'm an accountant person. I get like a 400 in my English SATs. I know nothing about writing. Um, best advice I ever got, hands down. Like I, we would, I would probably have, I bet we'd be half the size of what we are today if I didn't have our website and our blog. And that is how we drive 50, 60% of our business right now. 
Um, it, it crushes, it's a long-term investment, but it definitely works. Okay, so this one is gonna cost you both time and money, but invest in your training. I already talked about it. So I love, I love this saying, I got a couple quotes for you guys. So the, the old saying goes, you know, the, the secretary or whomever, middle, middle management's getting concerned over the train, they say, what happens if we train these people and then they leave? And the CEO answers, what happens if we don't and they stay? Which is brilliant, because that's what's gonna happen. Is like, so your options are train the people and so they leave, okay? Or you don't train them and then they stay. So either way, you're screwed. So you have, to train, you have to train them, right? And then hope that you can inspire them and motivate them to stay with you. But don't bring people in and don't train them. It's just, it's really, and no matter what their resume looks like, train them like they, they don't know anything about what they're doing and then see what their skill set is, right? But make sure you train and invest into your employees. That's gonna take time and money. Don't be afraid to take on debt to accelerate your business. Everyone wants to bootstrap. I did too. Um, if I do start another business, which I probably will, I will definitely seek out investors or a loan. Um, it's really tough to bootstrap a business. It, it takes a long time. And I think everyone gets a little bit freaked out about credit card debt or a loan. I say, if you're dialed in enough, you believe in your business enough, absolutely take, on, take a loan to accelerate. If you really wanna scale quickly, I wouldn't hesitate to um, because I believe in what I'm doing. I know that, I know that I'll do it quicker with money. Um, a, I call this one ABS, always be sourcing. I'm looking for employees today. If <laughs> you were counting people, I'm always looking for employees. I spend at least one day a week on LinkedIn just recruiting people. Um, when I go to networking events, I don't ask for customers, I ask for employees. I always, at dinner, when I'm out at front barbecues or whatever, I let everybody I know, know that I'm hiring. And the reason is, even, like I told you, even if I'm not, I will hire someone. Um, because you never know when you're gonna lose a person and it's, it is tough. Um, and we have diversified out to try and combat some of that, but you, always be sourcing talent if you're really trying to grow. Um, the last thing with, how can I save you time, money. I love, hard things are hard. Um, ben is a, yeah, Ben Hor Horowitz in his book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. I don't know if anyone's read it. Awesome book on startups. Um, kind of like the Silicon Valley type thing. It's kind of big business, probably maybe somewhat not applicable. But this quote was so brilliant in his book. He said, hard things are hard because there are no ans easy answers or recipes. They are hard because your emotions are at odds with your logic. They are hard because you don't know the answer and you cannot ask for help with sh without showing weakness. So his point there is, my point is, yeah, it's really tough. Like it is really hard. There's a lot of challenges and the people that are successful are good at asking questions. They're good at understanding what their weaknesses are and who the proper person is. Not, you know, don't be afraid. Don't think that you're asking this question and you're, you're showing weakness. You're not. You're showing that you understand you have a problem and you don't know how to solve it. So knowing who to ask the right questions to is crucial. And there, my whole thing is saving you time and money. Business is hard. It is, no matter what you learn, you're gonna, you're gonna get out there and fail. You're gonna get out there and learn some really hard lessons, but learning from them and asking the right questions is really what's gonna you know, set you apart. So future of, what is the future of my business? What do I think it will be? Um, I'm gonna go back and say staying relevant is my number one concern and trying to, the, the accounting industry and a lot of businesses are being disrupted by technology right now. Um, so I'm trying to really understand, am I, am I gonna be relevant five, 10 years from now? If not, should I implement an exit now or sooner than I intended to? Or can I beat this technology that's coming? Can I pivot somehow to continue to add value to our customers 
or is this technology really going to come in and destroy us? And if it is, <clears throat> what am I going to do about it? Am I just going to let that happen? Am I going to pivot to use it, or am I going to get out of the business? So I'm constantly trying, we're, we have a big board like this of everything that's going on in the industry. Hey, this software popped up, somebody research it. We're always looking at what's going on in the industry so we can make sure we stay at the top. Um, increase in our national presence, we're definitely branching out. We're moving to, got a couple employees moving to different states. The operations are staying here, but we're really trying to boost a national model right now start servicing more of the US. We already do. Um, we have clients in lots of states, but we're really trying to make that forward facing now and become more of a national presence. So we're going up against some pretty big boys, but um, online we're competing with them. You know, the idea with my business would be eventually to sell it to a competitor, a larger competitor. Um, and that is part of my exit plan down the road. And I'm I, I reevaluate that once, twice a year and look at, hey, is this still relevant to me in my life? Um, the thing that's really crucial about going over your exit plan is that you get to see, is it still relevant to where I'm at? And it's also a trigger like when you're reading, hey, my exit plan is when I hit $2 million, I sell. It gives you that trigger point of, okay, I'm implementing my exit, like I've hit that number. Um, otherwise, you just keep on going. There's no end goal, right? You're just, you're just in business and you just keep going. So I kind of go back to the exit plan. Um, solidify ourselves as a business and industry thought leader. I do a ton of blogging. I do a lot of guest posts. Um, lots of articles linking back to us. We're really trying to boost that presence and thought leadership online. That's been really huge for us. And operate without me. Um, as crazy as it sounds, a lot of people are like, why do you want to run a business that you're not a part of? It's like, well, it's not that you're not a part of it, but the business should be able to run without you. Um, and once you get to that point, I mean, it took me nine years to get where I'm at. I'm finally able to implement this mini exit from my business. I've been planning for like five years now. So the business will operate somewhat without me, but I'm still involved. So if I can get to the point where all I'm doing is collecting a paycheck, then I can start other businesses, I can do consulting, I can hang with my kid, I can fish, you know, whatever it is that I want to do. I mean, I'll start another business, I already know that, but it gives me a lot of flexibility and I think that a lot of people are like, no, I'm going to build like me as the business and that's kind of the thing with going to sell it is if you are the business, no one's going to buy it. They're going to look at it and be like, you're, you are the business. So if I buy it from you, I need you as an employee. So a lot of people don't get that strategy of that's why these employee contracts, if you line them up to be the business, someone will come in and acquire you because you're not necessary for them to continue what you're doing. They'll come in and take and say, like, hey, if I'm not needed, then I'm much more... Um, I can be acquired easier than someone who is needed in that business because they are, they are the business, if that makes sense. So the question, what is your answer to the question of relevance in five, ten years of technology? For, the, for my particular industry, we, I do think that we're going to be relevant. Um, I think the accounting industry will be relevant to the people who are going to make the proper pivots. There, there's a big, thing, big movement towards more of an advisory role, right? We were, we were always like, hey, punch the numbers in, you know, data entry, file the taxes. A lot of that's being done by software now. So we, we had to move into much more of an advisory role in not only producing the numbers for our clients, but really going in and offering them, hey, so this is a little bit about your numbers and your reports but I want to tell you my interpretation and what's good and what's bad on here. So we've had to do a lot more consulting just kind of as, a, as an add-on value add to our clients. And I think that there are a lot of accounts out there like, no, technology will never replace us. Those people I do think will go away because we'll gobble them up as will some of the bigger competitors that are embracing technology because we've learned how to work, use technology and service more clients. And if they just kind of like, no, no, I'm going to keep doing my thing. I think they are going to be replaced. So I think it's, you know, is that going to change in five years? I don't know. 
it, it certainly could.